Well, I'm Ron Penn, and I'm a member of the School of Music faculty where I teach musicology. I'm also director of the John Jacob Niles Center for American Music, and that's the room that we're in right now. I started my life in Chicago, Illinois, right in the middle of the city, now the place you would associate with Appalachia by any stretch of the imagination, unless you really knew the fact that a good chunk of Chicago was hillbilly. They were Kentuckians who lived and worked and settled in Chicago in the uptown area of the city. Uh, it was something of a mystery to me what Kentucky was and what the mountains were. It was kept from me because it was not uh, considered polite to be a hillbilly or a redneck and all of those stereotypes associated with it being barefoot and ignorant and carrying a jug with three X's around it and using an outhouse were those things that were associated with hillbillies and we were upscale people. My family you know, wanted me to have good music and a good education and play with the right kids and not be linked to that Kentucky tradition, which we did not consider a proud and rich tradition at the time. Unfortunately, there was a whole lot of music in Chicago that was of Appalachian descent. There was a thriving bluegrass scene. The uh, John Lair, whose collection resides at the University of Kentucky here, was also a very, very powerful force in Chicago with the National Barn Dance that brought up all kinds of musicians from Kentucky to perform professionally on the stage uh, in that radio program. People like Lily Mae Ledford and the Coon Creek Girls, Red Foley, other names like that. So Chicago was a very powerful extension of Appalachia, but for me, Appalachia was the building across the street. The hillbillies were the people across the street. And they were the people that fascinated me. Their life was lived outdoors all the time. Ours was contained in the nice Victorian row house. Theirs was lived out on the street. They got to play in the street, and I had to walk three blocks to the neighborhood park to play. They went to public school, and I had to go to private school. Their music was wild, exciting, and throbbing. Country music heard through the open windows, whereas we listened to Bach and Brahms and Beethoven and opera, and our windows were generally closed. There was a girl who had, you know, the, the stereotypical blonde hair and blue eyes whom I was just in love with from a distance, but I could only watch her from my window. The Healy Billies were those people again, whose life was open and in the streets, and um, they would say something like, Hey, Clem, you forgot them thar books. And the books would come three floors out of the window and hit the street with a thud. Clem would take them and wander off to school. So that's, in some ways, it formed a notion early in my mind what it was to be a hillbilly, to be an Appalachian, to be from Kentucky. And it dawned on me only years and years and years later when I found my way back to Kentucky and back to the University of Kentucky that these were my people, this was my soil, and this was my music, and something had been taken away from me. And so that which had been taken away from me I wanted to seize again, I wanted to appreciate, and um, I became, I guess, a converted Appalachian, uh, understanding that my roots really were back in the soil, and this music was very much a part of me. Music which is closest to home has the most power to affect us. My the music that uh, has a sense of place and an identity tied to that soil me. is really that music which has the most like power over us, the most ability to affect us. So There's lots of popular music all over the world that is the same in Tokyo as it is in Paris, as it is in Versailles, Kentucky. But there's a music that is rooted in the Appalachian people in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that is very, very special to us, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about. Now is the cool of the day. Now is the cool of the day. Oh, the earth is a garden, a garden of my Lord. 
And he walks in his garden in the cool of the day. There is a traditional music that runs very, very deep uh, that comes from across the Atlantic, uh, places like Ireland and Scotland and England and Germany, and mixed with the people who are living here, the indigenous people, the Cherokee, the African Americans who were brought here. And this music has flowed underground uh, like a stream nourishing the people for years and years and years. It's changed over the course of time, but it still provides this bedrock foundation for the popular music styles that have been built upon it. Those styles like bluegrass that emerged in the 1940s from old time music, from the old mountain music, or from gospel music, contemporary gospel gospel music that was built on the shape note hymnody and the old regular Baptist uh, lined out hymns. The country music that was commodified from the ballads that were the story narrative songs that came from uh, the 18th and 17th centuries in the old world. This is the music that is old-timey and yet has persisted and become a, a wellspring upon which people will draw for contemporary styles. Uh, particularly interesting that you see hip-hop music thriving in Appalachia with Appalachian folk samples woven into something they call hill-hop or hick-hop. So it's contemporary, but it is also traditional. Our music is uh, tied to the past, but it is very much a thing of the future and the present. Another part of our heritage that's an important one in Appalachia is the spiritual dimension. Um, some people say that mountains are particularly spiritual places. Christianity thrived here, but there's a Buddhist temple on Furnace Mountain uh, not far from here. There are every kind of religion known to mankind and womankind in, in Kentucky, in Appalachia. But some of the strongest currents are those that have rooted and adapted themselves in a much more... Uh, let's see, a stronger, a stronger current, a more native form, uh, the old regular Baptist church. It's an amazing uh, faith with a remarkable musical expression that is very much tied, again, to the oldest, older Orient, um, the older uh, British roots of lining out psalmody. Again, not because these are an illiterate people, but because they're pre-literate. If you don't have books, one way of sharing that tune is for a leader, and in England this would have been a deacon or a precentor, to give out that line of text, and then the congregation would know it, and they would respond. So even within the Anglican Church in England, they had this technique that passed it to this country and was really part of our psalmody at the beginning of the colonies in Massachusetts or at Jamestown. The way they would sing the psalms was by lining them out. They would take a song that we know today very well like Amazing Grace and they had very different tunes for that particular text of John Newton's. They would sing something like, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. They'd have that formula where they'd have that line, and then they would start to sing it as a, as a group, as a unity in congregational harmony. Now, the beauty of singing together in unison in harmony is that you create social harmony through the medium of musical harmony. And the beauty of this music is that it's one voice of many voices, but each one personalizes. Some people ornament it a little bit, some people come in a little bit later. It's a musical texture that we call heterophony in music history, but it's very difficult to get people in this, um, who are trained in music at all, to sing in this style, because we're so used to singing everybody in lockstep together and beginning and ending together and not personalizing the music. The beauty of old regular Baptist hymnody is that each person's voice is cherished and important and an individual voice, but they come together in absolute unity as a group. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And then the response. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. So you have to imagine that as a soloist and a response of people. And at any moment that singing might burst forth in an old regular Baptist ceremony, preachers could be preaching emphatically, wonderfully in this incredibly engaging style, but if that preacher goes on too long or if he hits a thought and an idea that appeals to the people, they might suddenly sing him out, start singing a song, interrupting his preaching, to seize on that idea and allow the music and the preaching to flow together as a continuous, seamless whole. As a musician, I was, I was trained from the age of four to play piano by reading it from notes. I can't play any of that music today unless I have the notes in front of me. But if I learn a fiddle tune or I learn a song from a person through oral tradition, becomes part of me, becomes, it, it lives in my heart. I learn it by heart. And I can sing it, I'll be able to sing it until my dying days. And so there's a very real difference between the way people learn in Appalachia and other places. One of the ways of singing that I just gave you, the lined out psalmody of the old regular Baptist church in New England, when, that, when they were doing that, the clergy complained about that singing style and they compared it to the rasping of saws and the braying of asses. And so to change that, they said, we'll have singing schools. We'll teach people how to sing. We'll teach them how to read notes and we'll teach them how to sing music properly. And they did that. They did that from books um, that uh, were, were first published in the 1700s and eventually uh, we had a very rich tradition in our colonies with people like William Billings and Jeremiah Engels and Daniel Reed writing these songs that were peculiarly American right at the time of the American Revolution that are a window into our history. They are the embodiment of what people were thinking about, democracy independence. They said, how can we have unity of our people and yet allow incredible personal freedom? How can we do that? Well, when you look at the music, you have this window into it in which each line is a separate melody, but they come together in a unity and in a harmony. This is the most linear kind of music. Each line is a separate integral kind of voice. In 1801, William Little and William Smith took this a little one step further and said, why don't we put those notes in different shapes to make it easier for people to read? And they call it shape notes. Um, today we frequently refer to it as sacred harp singing or shape note singing. This book is the Sacred Harp. It's the most recent edition of the book, um, 1991. It is it's, a, it's the treasury of our, our song. Uh, it is the oldest songs coming from Britain, the old world, and Germany, but it's also the songs that were written in the colonies at the beginning of our country and have been added to, onto uh, songs that were composed in 1991. Uh, these were taught in singing schools, singing school masters uh, such as Amzi and Lucius Chapin that traveled throughout Kentucky, teaching people to read this music by the shapes, and then leaving behind the books with them. So these became old and treasured companions in homes throughout the American South, very much if you found 
two books in a home, one would be a Bible, and the other would probably be the Sacred Harp or the Southern Harmony. I gave you a little bit of a feel for Amazing Grace in a different tune, uh, lined out psalmody. I thought maybe I'll do what we call New Britain, which is the tune that we know as Amazing Grace today, coupled with it. A little bit of a feel for how that sounds in shape note hymnody. I'm going to go to the third line down in this four-part harmony, and it's what we call the air or the tenor. You'd call it the tenor today, the, the, the line. But instead of the melody being in the top line, the soprano, the way most choral music is, the tenor line, which both women and men would sing, is buried down there. And I'm going to sing it with the shapes. Fa, so, so, fa, la, fa, la, so, fa, la, so. So fa la fa la, so la so. The trebles, the top part, also sung by men as well as women, would have a different line, but it would be just as interesting as that original tenor line. And they would sing something like this. Fa la la so, so la. So, so la, fa la so, fa la so, so fa fa. Well, you can't have this singing without the men's voices down below that rumble that holds it all together, the bass line. So what I'm going to do is sing one verse of Amazing Grace on the bass line. Fa. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbid to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. You have to Use your imagination to hear those parts that I sang one after another and picture them sung by a number of voices all at once simultaneously. Hugh McGraw, who is one of the great patriarchs of this music, a uh, man who is kind of informally credited with putting out this last edition of the book, a man whose family stretched back for generations of association with the Sacred Heart. Hugh McGraw said to me once, you know, Ron, I wouldn't cross the street to listen to this music, but I'd walk a hundred miles on broken glass to sing it. And it taught me everything I needed to know about it in that one sentence. This is music to be shared with people. The experience of shared social harmony was important. And it's not a good music to listen to, sit back and listen to, but it is music to share and enjoy and revel in. Well, we've been spending a little bit of time on Sunday, church, kind of meeting, music there, sacred harps, old regular Baptists. It's probably a good idea to look at the Saturday night, too. Um, square dances used to exist all over the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, they would take place at houses where they would clear out the furniture on the lawn and move, move it into the house. They were breaking up Christmas parties that would take place every single night until that big log in the fireplace got burned up uh, about two weeks after old Christmas. There were dances that were regular parts of community life. And then something changed. World War II happened. People traveled to Detroit or to Chicago or to Dayton, Ohio. 
and families were broken up and sundered. People were traveling back and forth from the city back to the country. Um, rock and roll hit. Elvis Presley hit. Jerry Lee Lewis, Johnny Cash, people who would have been old time Appalachian and Southern Mountain players um, who were singing gospel, who were part of the Pentecostal gospel uh, kind of movement, and yet they went into rock and roll. And that popular medium changed things dramatically, and the old square dances, the old mountain music almost died completely. Uh, but the, the dances are something that were tied to ways of joining people in the community in an ageless, classless, sexless way. This isn't couple dancing, this is square dancing, in which you pass on uh, your moves to everybody in the community, and it doesn't matter how old you are, you're going to be sharing that move, that figure with the couple, before you move on to the next couple. And it was a, a wonderful way of, of exulting in the movement and the body and all that tied people together. The engine that drove that music was the, the dance music, the fiddle tunes. And again, this is a music that started its life on the other side of the Atlantic and passed over here. An incredible union of, uh, let's call it Scots-Irish kinds of fiddle tunes mixed with the French fiddle tunes and the German fiddle tunes of those people came here and mixed with the African the African-American sound. The, the style of southern playing, southern mountain playing, is so influenced by the rhythmic drive of the banjo, which is, can be, its origins can be traced to West Africa, and is very much an African-American form of the art. There are little blues inflections in the music that are clearly, clearly African as well. And so it's a, this music is a wonderful way of, of demonstrating the assimilation of people's Again, a unity of peoples, but with incredible individual strains that can still be heard, just like the shape note hymnody lines are part of this overwhelming fabric of the whole, but each line is individual. So fiddle tune. The architecture of these is very simple, 16 bars usually, an A section that's repeated, and a B section that's repeated. Everybody's playing the melody in the unison, but each person's personalizing it, ornamenting it a little bit differently. You've got the guitar below you outlining the chords and providing a little bit of bass. You've got that banjo providing the percussive pop for it and embroidering a melody around the fiddle tune melody. And then you might have a bass player. In the old days, they would have a cello or a bass, and frequently they would use a wash tub bass, things made at hand, uh, just a wash tub with a pole and a string. And you can play any kind of bass you want to on that wash tub. And a, a good player can make it sing just like a fine Guarneri string bass. The mandolin traveled and the mandolin joined that ensemble. Um, you would see people playing fiddlesticks, like the expression, uh, tapping on the strings with little pieces of wood or straw to create a percussive kind of rhythm while the fiddler was playing. You might see the jaw harp, the trump, the Jew's harp along with it, people sharing in that music making even while the dance is going. 
And that's the part of this, this is an active kind of music, it accompanies the dance, it allows the dance to thrive and flourish and keeps everybody in their figures and keeps everything in time. But it's also a music to be just enjoyed on the porch by other musicians getting together and sharing those fiddle tunes. So it's a, it's a rich and wonderful tradition that is part of our past, a cultural legacy that lingers in the mountains, but it also provides a backdrop for the music of the present and the future. It's that same fiddle that's woven into a more elegant texture in our bluegrass music that becomes very, very progressive. It's that same fiddle that's woven into country music that's found its way to Nashville and became commodified as the uh, folk expression of Appalachia, um, but in a more popular medium. It's the same fiddle tunes that um, have become part of what we call Americana or a kind of American classical music um, that have uh, been woven into this, this new style that, that's more at home in concert halls than it is back in the barn dance or the porch. So this is a music that continues to influence who we are as a people even while its roots are still very, very much tied to the soil. And that's the relationship between words and music in this in incredible, um, kind of vague, misty, ambiguous way in which our languages of music and spoken language come together in the ballads, in the shape note singing, in the old regular Baptist singing, where the sermon and the, the, and the lined out singing become one. We are a very musical people. The shared music is a very important heritage in Appalachia. There are all kinds of venues for, for hearing the music of the people, and it's spread throughout all the world, and, and it's just as easy to hear on an iPod as to hear uh, any other kind of music. The music is one window to understanding who a people, who the people are. Our music is a window on that culture. Farewell pretty Sarah, I'll bid you adieu. And I'll but this is music to be shared Sarah by people in an active way. And that's a very, very important aspect of music in Appalachia. My love, she won't have me so I understand. You never sing she those words, but you can almost hear them sung in the tune itself. And that's the relationship the between words and the music in this in incredible, um, kind of vague, misty, land. ambiguous way in which our languages of music and spoken oh, language come together. All the fine things that a big house can hold. These songs are bitter if irony. They are biting social satire. They are, you know, very grim kinds of lyrics. Some of them are tied to ancient mythological uh, subjects I'd like corn. And unless letter, you understand that, so she you really understand. don't understand this music. I'd ride it by the river where the waters overflow. And I'll dream of pretty Sarah wherever I go. And so it is. We people all over our country and all over the world listen to our bluegrass and our mountain music. But unless you understand the, the taste of cornbread, you don't really get the music. Unless you see a mountain top being removed, the wild you don't understand Gene Ritchie's Black Waters. Unless you really understand the entire cultural breeze. web surrounding this music, this window Farewell, is an opaque one. But the window can open up the rest of the culture I'll if you, you allow up. the rest of the context to be put into place. And I'll dream of pretty Sarah. Away.